All right, let's continue on with the next lab here. Uh, once again, we're going to be exploiting the jQuery selector function, which is the same that we did last time. This little dollar sign in the jQuery uh, script that we saw. Only this time we're going to be exploiting the location.hash property instead of the href uh, return path like we did last time. And to solve the lab, we want to deliver an exploit to the victim that calls the print function in their browser. So this one's going to be a little bit different. We're not going to call alert this time, but it's going to be good to see uh, that we don't always have to alert. That's just sort of our default, um, but there's other things that we could potentially do. Another aspect of this lab that we're going to see, you see it says deliver an exploit to the victim that calls the function in their browser. This lab is actually going to utilize an exploit server for the first time in this series. Later in the video, once we get to it, I will talk about what an exploit server is in these labs. But just know that this is going to be a little bit more advanced than a simple reflected cross-site scripting attack. We're actually going to be able to do a little bit more with it using this exploit server. All right, so here we are at the lab. Um, pretty standard. The blog, as usual. We're pretty used to this by now. Um, we can go to exploit server. We can go back to lab description. We can go home. There's no submit feedback page. There's no login page. Uh, we're sort of on our own on this. So let's see... Let's look at a post, see if there's any comment functionality. There is comment functionality. Let's look at this comment functionality and see if they fixed how we exploited it last time. You can see here, I tried to enter our scripts just like we used to do, but this was escaped really well. This was escaped just as you would want it to. So if we use the view page source here, I think you would actually see that these are described as less than greater than signs, um, not as the actual symbol. I think I mentioned this briefly in a previous video, um, and I know that it will come up later in the series, but this is how you want to safely allow people to leave comments. You want to escape this input, as we call it. And here's what that looks like. So here's my comment right here. It looks almost unrecognizable, but this is a way for the website to tell the browser, I want you to treat this as a comment or something that the user wrote, not as an actual HTML symbol. So it sends actual less than greater than signs for HTML tags like this, and it sends things like quotation marks, less than greater than signs, etc., as these which the browser knows to show as this, but it actually has no chance of, of being rendered as an HTML tag. So this is how you want to correctly render our script input like this so that it isn't dangerous to the website. All right, so back on the homepage, let's actually use inspect again to try to figure out where the vulnerable code is and what it sort of looks like. Here we go, this is gonna be it. So very similar to the last one. Basically, this is the functionality that you can copy a specific line or comment and share a link to that specifically. So you don't just have to link to the blog, share it with your friend, and hope that they find the paragraph that you were talking about. You can actually share a link to the specific paragraph or line. All right, now we've got our hash up here. Let's try the script tag like we like to do it, the old fashioned way. That doesn't seem to have done anything. Let's try our image source tag and see if that works. Huh, that seemed to work. I wonder why that is. Well, from the Stack Overflow post, we can see that you cannot run a script tag within a script tag. So in this case, we have to try to get it to create a different element, like an image tag, rather than a script tag. That's great and all, but it asks us to print, not alert. So let's get that going. Wow, okay. So that's what that looks like. Turns out there's more than one way to abuse a browser with cross-site scripting. In this case, we got it to try to print rather than just alerting. Unfortunately, as you can see, we still haven't solved the lab. This is because we haven't used the exploit server yet. Let's take a look at that. In some of these Web Security Academy labs, particularly the ones that have to do with authentication, like we'll see in a later series, we'll use what they call an exploit server. Basically what this is, is a separate web server or website that we control that an unknowing victim might visit. For the sake of the labs, the Web Security Academy also assumes that you have successfully tricked the victim into clicking on a link or accessing the server in some way. So we don't need to worry about that part of the exploitation. On this screen, we control what goes on the exploit server. We've already established that there's an opportunity for cross-site scripting on the blog website from earlier. 
that is a different web server or website than this exploit server. What we are about to do is create a window to the blog website on our malicious website, on our exploit server. Then, when the victim visits our exploit server, we will execute cross-site scripting on the victim's web browser using the window to the blog website that we created and the cross-site scripting vulnerability that we found on the blog website. This part of the iframe so far is just saying that our source is the blog website. Notice there's nothing here that says exploit server. This is my personal session with the Web Security Academy right now. This is the address of the blog website. This part of it just says that once you load the iframe, add to the source attribute, which is this, add to our URL, this hash image source one on air print, which is the same as the cross site scripting vulnerability that we found on the blog website earlier. And then we close our iframe. Let's see if this works. First, we store it to save it on our web exploit server. Then we view the exploit. Then we get the cross site scripting that we were talking about. Notice what's happening here is that we're on the exploit server. We do not have the cross site scripting vulnerability in our URL. I've changed it here to alert because the print wouldn't stop popping up. So hopefully this will allow us to see sort of what's happening. Here we go. So here's the text that I created because this is essentially just a web server. Just like when I created that website for Moose, the text that I put in that body is appearing right here, just like a normal website. Then we have our iframe, which I thought would be on the next line, but is actually right next to everything else. Oops. The iframe is like a portal to another website. It basically allows us to see another website or media peeking through a hole through the internet. It has valid uses in embedding content, like advertisements, videos, or images from other sources. What is happening here is that the iframe is reaching out to this other blog website and basically putting a portal to that blog website onto our web page. Then, because there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability on that web page, it's appearing on our own web page. And the user, who in this case is me, is experiencing that cross-site scripting even though I never even visited that initial blog website. So now, there's cross-site scripting on the blog website and there's cross-site scripting on my website, which has an iframe to that blog website. Let's change this back to print and deliver the exploit to the victim to solve the lab. Ta-da, congratulations, we did it, just like that. This one was a little longer and a little more complicated, but we worked through it and we solved the problem. Thanks for watching, see you on the next one.